All right, so on Friday, we were talking about the uh, laws of thermodynamics. We talked about the first law and the second law. Okay, first law is energy can't be created or destroyed. Okay, so it's essentially the law of conservation of energy. Okay, and the second law of thermodynamics tells us which direction energy flows. It flows from a high energy object to a low energy object. That could be a fast moving object to a slow moving object. Okay, it could be a hot object to a cold object. Doesn't matter what kind of energy, it always flows from high to low. All right, those are the first two laws of thermodynamics. Then we looked at a few applications of those. Okay, and we looked at heat engines and heat pumps, and we looked at jet engines and how they're a heat engine, how your refrigerator is a heat pump, okay, and things like that. Today, what we're going to look at is how we were actually able to develop fairly significant technology before we really understood the laws of thermodynamics. Okay, we were very lucky, okay, to say the least. All right, so very early on, okay, people were trying to find ways to eliminate the need for either large numbers of slaves or large numbers of pack animals, okay, in order to uh, to do massive amounts of work. All right, the Industrial Revolution couldn't have happened unless we were able to replace slave labor with machines, because obviously slave labor is not acceptable. All right, and so while it worked for the Egyptians and they built massive pyramids and things like that, without the help of aliens, just massive numbers of slaves. Okay, um, it's obviously not acceptable to do so now. So there had to be ways to make either one person's work multiplied or just have a machine do it entirely. All right, so some of the first ideas okay, had to do with the movement of water. People needed to pump water from place to place. The Romans built the aqueducts and things like that. All right, um, but more importantly, the Industrial Revolution was fueled by what source of energy? Small and hard and black. Coal. All right, where do you get coal from? Mines. Okay. The problem with coal mines is they fill with water. All right. And so there had to be ways to pump water out of these mines. And so people started coming up with some some ideas for how they could do that. Okay. The Archimedes screw was one of the earliest pumps. Problem with the Archimedes screw. Unless you got a guy who can really turn that thing really really fast and never stop, it only pumps about three feet maybe six feet if you got a really energetic guy all right because you have to get it moving fast enough that gravity doesn't pull the water back down the auger is essentially just an auger if you've ever used a post hole auger an ice auger something like that okay this is essentially all it is now you know that as soon as you pull the auger up it just all the dirt just rolls down the auger because it's a hill okay everybody got me there okay so an auger is like a screw okay a screw is just an inclined plane wrapped around an axis. That's why if you ever get into really big trouble, I will tell you that you are an inclined plane wrapped around an axis. Come on, that's from Big Bang. That's funny. You're screwed if you're an inclined plane wrapped around an axis. Okay? All right. Uh, so the problem with that is obviously it couldn't lift very much water and it couldn't lift it very far. But it was better than four guys with pails, okay, shoveling away. Right? Um, it, it, could, it could be powered by one person. Right, the um, we have the Persian wheel, kind of a similar idea. Okay, it would uh, it had these buckets. Okay, on this wheel, and you the, a person would turn this geared wheel that would turn the wheel with the buckets on it. The buckets would be taken down into the water where they would fill with water, and then as they got to the top, the water would spill out and be caught by this tray, and then it could go somewhere else. Problem with that: water will only flow downhill. Right. So while it's good for bailing out like a bilge on a ship or something like that, it's not really good for getting water out of a mine. Okay. All right. Um, now, the first kind of machine that used power that was not human or animal okay, was Hero's steam engine. Okay, the very first one that kind of used this, these hidden secrets that people knew about that were in, uh, that were in certain types of of, uh, of fuel. All right. um, so what he found was that if you heated up water and it turned into steam, it created pressure. And pressure could be used to do what? To do work. Exactly. All right. the, the whole idea of a steam engine or an in internal combustion engine, doesn't matter what kind of engine, is that hot gases can exert pressure. And if you put them in a confined space with a piston that can move, they will push the piston. 
All right, and that's what all steam engines and internal combustion engines do. All right, Hero was the first person to develop a steam engine, so he had this big fire, okay, that was underneath a boiler, all right, or actually it was underneath the engine itself, and it boiled the water that was in the engine, and the engine would get the the steam would start pushing on the piston, pushing on the piston, eventually move the piston, but that was it. Okay, it wasn't reciprocating. Right? Reciprocating means it moves back into the initial position after it's done its work. So, to make Hero steam engine do work again, you had to cool it off and move it all back down to the same... It was mostly just a, a theoretical construct. It was never really used to do anything, okay, other than prove that this worked. All right. Okay, so, like we said, for most of recorded history, there were humans and animals to do all the work, okay? Um, but obviously, that we had to we had to do something better than that. So, the idea here, Hero's problem was his steam engine didn't reciprocate. But the idea here with this pump, this is a reciprocating pump. All right? So when you're turning the crank, you push in and that creates pressure here. What that pressure does is closes the inlet valve. All right? So if you have water down here, okay, um, water is drawn in when the piston moves this way. Everybody got me? Okay, when you move the piston this way, it sucks the top valve down and pushes the top and sucks the t the bottom valve up. All right, that draws water into the chamber. As soon as that piston starts to move forward, the process is reversed. The pressure closes the intake valve and opens the exhaust valve, and stuff gets pumped out the other way. All right, so you have to have these series of valves, otherwise it doesn't work. Right? It took. Uh, I see people go oh, mind blown, but I mean, it took a while for people to figure that out. Okay, um, but once they did figure that out, they had pumps that could work in two directions. All right, rather than you know somebody with pails. All right. So technology obviously doesn't appear out of nowhere. Okay, there has to be some sort of reason to build it, and then there has to be development, research, and things like that. We call it R and D now. Okay, but at the time it used to be called trial and error. All right, and back in the industrial revolution, it was called trial and error. Um, so the new technology comes along. Somebody sees how it works and goes, I can do better. Okay, And they make something a little bit better and so on. And we see that process going on all the time. All right. So 1680, Christian Huygens, who was a Dutch mathematician who is actually better known for studying stuff in space, developed this engine. Thankfully, it never caught on. It is the gunpowder engine. He, dis he discovered that if you put gunpowder in an enclosed space and detonate it, it can do stuff. Okay. Wow. He, I don't know where he got the idea from. but okay. So anyway, he had the gunpowder in there, and when he blew it up, okay, it would move the piston. Problem with his engine, you could use it once. Okay. It was really hard to build something that could repeatedly withstand the explosion of gunpowder. Right. So, I mean, while it gave everybody the idea of, hey, expanding gases can move a piston. It wasn't really practical. Again, it had didn't reciprocate. It blew itself up every time. Okay, things like that. All right. Uh, we talked about the heat engine, all right, things like that. This is Hero's kind of, okay, uh, steam engine here. Pappen kind of developed one like this as well, right, where you got the water and everything inside of here, which is not a very efficient design, right? If you actually have the water inside the chamber, you're always having to cool it off in order to make the piston come back down. Right? So the way to make this thing do another cycle was to put the fire out, throw water all over the machine okay, until it cooled off and the piston moved back down because all the gases condensed back inside. Right? Then you heat it up again, it could move up. wasn't very practical. Right? Okay. All right, so the Savory engine. Okay, in England, Thomas Savory invented the first successful steam-powered pump. Okay, which was used to pump water out of mines. Pump could lift water only six meters. Okay, well that wasn't great. Okay, but it was better than a bunch of than uh, essentially a fire brigade. If you've ever seen a fire brigade, it's a bunch of guys with pails. Okay, kind of just bailing the water out. All right, uh, so the steam would have to be under higher pressure. The problem wasn't that they didn't know how to build it. It was that they couldn't keep the the metal sealed together okay they had the idea they knew they could make it work they just couldn't seal the container very well and so when you get to a certain amount of pressure the r the seals would rupture okay which was dangerous if you were standing next to it because what would happen you get this thing that's full of hot steam and suddenly it ruptures steam comes out you don't want to be standing next to that you'll get scalded 
right? And that's what happened to a lot of people that worked with this machine is that they crank it up. Oh, we can make it pump just a little farther, stoke it a little bit, put a little more heat under that. Okay, and then the thing would break and, and the steam would come out. All right, so um, it wasn't that they didn't know how to build a better one. They just, they couldn't. They couldn't, they didn't have the manufacturing capability to make the tight seals with metal joints. Okay, all right, so that was kind of Savory's uh, engine there. It had the boiler and then the steam went in here, okay, and it could pump the water that way. Okay, now, Newcomen came along. Newcomen was a smart guy, okay. Um, so, he, he had this idea, he had the boiler, okay, and he had, okay, down below here the piston could move, and then that would, you know, turn this pivot thing here, right, and uh, the problem again was it wasn't reciprocating, none of these pumps were, okay, and so every time they wanted to, to redo it, they had to cool the whole thing down, okay, bring, to bring the piston back in and then start over. All right, watt, okay, there's a reason why the unit for power is named after this guy. Okay. He developed the first practical, working, reciprocating steam engine. All right. Uh, uh, so he was called in. He was always asked to repair the new common engines because they were always breaking. Okay. They weren't very uh, effective design. So he realized there was a tremendous waste of heat when water was heated and cooled in the same cylinder. All right. He said, that doesn't make any sense. Why don't we heat the water in one place and vent the steam over to where the piston is? And then we can have another valve that opens and we can have the returning water or the condensing water come back and we can reheat it rather than having to cool the piston every single time. Right? So that was his idea to get the, the two parts separated. Okay? Um, so we had a condenser that cooled the steam and a boiler that always remained hot and so you weren't always having to do that cycle. Okay? Um, again, the, the only issue with, with even his steam engine was that they were really, really big. Okay? They didn't have any way to miniaturize them. Right. And so they could only be used in a few places or in really big buildings and okay, and things like that. Okay, internal combustion engine. This is the one we use all the time. Okay, why don't we use a steam engine? Inefficient. We can make them small now. Okay, and we can. The problem is you have to carry all that water on board all the time. Okay, water's heavy. Okay, and. Uh, and you've got obviously always the worry of temperature outside versus inside. With an internal combustion engine, the fuel is on board. The fuel is what makes the expanding gases, not the water. So you don't have to have two separate things. Right? With a steam engine, you have to have fuel plus water. An internal combustion engine, you only need fuel. All right? And so it works more efficiently for the mass you have to carry. Okay. All right. So the first internal combustion uh, engine meant that the actual ex the actual explosion, the burning, happens within the cylinder. All right? The steam engine is an external combustion engine. Regardless of what kind it was, it was an external combustion engine. There was fire underneath a boiler boiling the water. Internal combustion means the fuel has actually exploded inside the engine. All right? So the gunpowder engine was an internal combustion engine. Once. Okay? Once each time you built one. All right, so you have this fuel okay, that is ignited by an electrical spark inside the engine. The engine has to have a tight seal, all right, which means you've got some metal-on-metal metal contact. Okay? Is that efficient? Not really. Okay, so what do we do to make it more efficient? What do you have to check on your car periodically? Oil, yeah. If you didn't know that, you have to check that regularly. Okay, check it like once a week, maybe once every two weeks. Okay, if you because if you run out of oil, you've got metal on metal with no lubrication. That means engine seizes. Okay, and then you're in big trouble. All right, so you have to have uh, lubrication in there that makes the metal slide past each other. Okay, more efficiently. Okay, so the drawbacks of the first one, okay, uh, was the fuel it used, coal gas. Okay, wasn't really efficient that way, okay, in that coal gas was highly volatile and, and unstable and things like that, and so it didn't work very well, okay. Um, now, Otto and Eugene Longen, okay, improved the efficiency of the engine by compressing the coal gas, okay, and that was the key thing. Before, they just had a piston with some air fuel, and they would detonate the air fuel, and the piston would move down, but what they discovered is if you compress, if you make that piston move up and compress the fuel and air, it detonates hotter. And it, as a result, 
the gases expand further and they are able to do more work, which means it's way more efficient. Right? And that's what our, what our engines do now, is when the fuel and air gets into the piston, into the combustion chamber, okay, it is drawn in by the piston moving down. Then the piston moves up to compress it. And when the piston gets to the very top of the cylinder, that's when the spark plug will ignite the air-fuel mixture, when it is at its most compressed. Okay? That pushes the piston back down. Right? So the piston moves up and down twice in every cycle. It only actually does work once. It relies on the other ones okay, to make sure that it's always being pulled back up into position. All right, so that's what you see here. This is the cycle that goes on essentially inside of your car's engine. All right, so you've got in here what's called the intake phase. During the intake phase, the intake valve is open and the exhaust valve is closed. So in the intake valve comes the air-fuel mixture. All right, and the piston is sort of near the top. Right. Now what happens is the piston is moving down here. So we have okay, this phase where it's all being drawn in. When the piston gets to the bottom okay, and starts pushing back up, okay, the exhaust valve closes, the intake valve closes, and the gases are compressed. So we call that the compression phase. Okay. When the piston gets to the very top, then the spark plug sparks. Okay. The fuel mixture is ignited okay, and we get the expansion or the power stroke. Okay. This is where that piston is doing active work. So the gases expand, force the piston down, okay, and then when the piston comes back up, the exhaust valve opens and all the exhaust gases, carbon dioxide and whatever else, get pushed out and into your exhaust system. Okay. So that's what goes on inside of your car essentially. It's a little bit more complex than that with modern vehicles, but it's essentially the same thing. Okay. In more modern vehicles, you will have two intake valves and two exhaust valves in each cylinder because it makes it more efficient. Okay. All right. Okay. So again, the auto engine, even though it was use that same idea, was still using coal gas as a fuel. That doesn't burn very hot, so the engine wasn't very powerful, not even one horsepower. All right. um, so the big thing was finding a better fuel. Right? And it was found that uh, the gasoline okay, was, was the, uh, the best fuel for this motor. And once that was developed and discovered, then we were able to make more and more powerful motors as a result. Right? Okay. Um, and we'll skip over this future technology stuff. Okay. Um, and we're also going to skip over that. We don't need to do any of that. That's all trivia. Okay. So we're going to skip that and go straight to scalars and vectors now. Okay. All right. So you need less than six here, guys. All right. Now we're getting to the calculating part okay, of, of physics. So we're going to be using the first formula you're going to have in physics today. V equals D over T. We will also be using this formula. V equals D over T. Uh, it's not a trick. They are different. Okay. You'll notice that in one of the formulas, there are little arrows over top of the V and the D. Okay? That tells us that those quantities are what we call vector quantities. They not only have a magnitude, like kilometers, like 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers per hour or something like that, they also have a direction. So 20 kilometers north or 20 kilometers per hour west okay, or whatever. They always have a direction associated with them. Okay? The ones in here are what we call scalar quantities and they don't have any direction. They just have a size. Right. How many people believe that speed and velocity are the same thing? It's okay to say yes, because up until now that's what you've been told. Okay. They are in fact not exactly the same. They are very close, okay, but they do have one slight difference. Speed is a scalar quantity. Well, velocity is a vector quantity. Okay, this is why if you ever get pulled over by the police, you get a speeding ticket. You do not get a velocitying ticket. Ever notice that? Nobody ever says they got a velocitying ticket. 
because when they get the ticket, it doesn't tell them what direction they were going. Because the police officer, quite frankly, doesn't care. You were going 140 in a 100 zone. That's all that matters. Not which direction. Unless, of course, you were going the wrong way down, down Deerfoot. Then the direction also matters, but that's a separate charge. Okay? Um, you do have to worry, though, about okay, the fact that speed does not have a direction. Okay? Whereas velocity does. Okay? And we'll show you why that makes a big difference when we start getting into... Um, kind of problem solving and stuff. All right, so there's lots of different ways to measure how far apart or how fast objects are going. We have to differentiate between distance, displacement, speed, and velocity. Okay, distance, also scalar, displacement is vector. Okay, speed, scalar, velocity, vector. All right, and then we'll solve problems using V equals D over T, which is just as easy to manipulate as the mole equation was. All right, simple three variable formula that you will not use a triangle for. Okay. All right. So the big problem here guys with the way that we as North Americans understand um, direct or understand sort of movement is that we do everything or we get places by what method? Car, right? Okay? We get from place to place by car. North American culture okay, is built around being able to move anywhere you want in a car. All right? How many people in this classroom have ever ridden a passenger train? I can't even put up my hand. I've never ridden one. <laughs> okay. Now, if I ask you that question in Europe, everybody puts up their hand. Because that's in Europe how you get around. Okay. Most people in Europe don't own a car. Okay, they get from place to place by the subway or by rail or whatever. All right, but in North America, well, things are further apart. Okay, and so we built a, a series of roads instead of a series of well, we built a railway too, but roads were just easier. All right, uh, so the the problem with the way we talk about things is that we don't convey things properly. All right, I'll give you an example. This is a map of a hike I did one time, a backpacking trip. I ran into a guy, okay, um, and we'd been hiking. We actually did this long day here, okay, and we'd been hiking for quite a while. It was a tough day, and um, we met up with the guy, ended up, it was about here, okay, where we met up with this guy, and we were just dead tired, and he was just kind of starting out. It was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, I said to him, oh, man, we're just bagged. Like, how far is it to the next campground? You must have come from there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just... It's just like uh, half an hour that way. Now, what we didn't realize at the time, and in hindsight, it's always 2020. This guy was wearing like army fatigues, had like his army issue gear, okay, all of that kind of stuff. He was probably like a Navy SEAL, okay, or something like that. So he could run with a hundred pounds on his back. Meanwhile, we'd been hiking, trudging all day with 50 pounds on our back. We we're kind of tired. We're like, oh, sweet, it's only half an hour. We'll just walk, you know, we'll just walk for another half an hour and we'll be at the campground. Okay, he was walking downhill and he was in way better shape than we were. We were walking uphill and we were already tired. How long do you suppose it took us? <coughs> hour and a half, yeah, took us. And boy, by the time we got to the campground, we were some kind of sour with that guy. But we knew there was no hope of catching up with him to get even, okay? Plus he would have tuned us in probably, okay? So, um, the problem is, is that we had something different about what we were doing. His speed was much greater than ours. All right? And he described to us how long it took him to get from where we were to the campground. What did we ask him? We asked him how far it is. He didn't tell us how far. That was the problem. He told us how long it took him. That's useless. Okay? Telling someone how long it took you is useless. All right? That's like telling a five-year-old that you can run 10 kilometers in 40 minutes. He can't. He'd be lucky if he got that done all day. Okay? You have to consider the way that we deal with things. That's the way we as North Americans tell people how far things are. Okay? How far is this place? Oh, it's about two hours. Okay? How far is that place? Oh, it's 45 minutes from here. We tell people how long it takes, and we do that because we assume they're going to get on the road that goes from here to there and go about the speed limit, and that's how long it will take. Okay. Well, what if the roads are really bad? 
Is it going to take 45 minutes? No, it's going to take an hour and a half. Okay, because you can't go 100, you can only go 50. Right? So these are things to think about. You have to consider how we think about distance in North America and know that it's wrong. Okay? It's just simply wrong. We don't tell people things the right way. All right? So the way we travel the way we describe travel in everyday life is really only effective at getting you hopelessly lost, okay, in a roadless or trackless environment. Even if the guy did say, like if let's say there was no trail to follow, and we said, Well, how far is the campsite from here? And he says, Oh, it's eight hundred meters. How many options do we have for getting there? Yeah, 360 options. Right? If there's no trail, we have 360 choices for which direction to walk 800 meters in. Only one of which will actually end us up in the right place. Okay? Right? If, if I was to ask you how, f how far it is to Edmonton, okay, it, you'd tell me it's around 300 kilometers. What if I don't know the geography of Alberta? Does that help me get there? No. You assume I'm going to get on the road and follow Highway 2 all the way to Edmonton. And it's going to be about 300 kilometers along Highway 2. But if there's no road, that's useless. Okay? It'll only get me really, really lost. Right? Now, if you said, you know, how far is it to Calgary? And you said, well, it's about, you know, 35 kilometers. I got a better chance because, you know, Calgary is pretty wide. All right? And I could probably walk in about 30 or 40 different directions and actually end up at least in some part of Calgary. Okay? But again, it's not really effective at getting me where I want to go. So that's the difference between a scalar quantity and a vector quantity. Okay? A scalar quantity is, well, Edmonton is 300 kilometers from here. Right. A vector quantity is Edmonton is 300 kilometers north of here. Okay. Is that a more useful? Okay. Well, even saying north isn't great because it isn't straight north of here. It's a few degrees probably east of north okay, from here. Right. Okay. okay, so that's the example we have. When we say Calgary is 40 kilometers away, we make no reference to which direction Calgary is. We just get on the road because that's what we as North Americans do. So in this case, we've made a scalar description of where Calgary is. We say, we've only said how far, not which way. Because okay. in actual fact, it may be in a slightly different direction. So, so let's say we're starting down here in Okotoks. Okay to get to the airport is actually well just slightly off of straight north of here uh, so about two degrees west of north okay everybody follow me there about two degrees west of north gets me to the to the airport if I walked straight north I'd probably be able to see it still by the time I got there okay the only problem is the farther you go the amount you're off by gets greater and greater right not really a big problem you know in, in you know in over small distances but if you imagine let's say you're you know working for NASA and you're trying to get a space probe to to hit a certain planet if you're off by one degree over that kind of distance uh, you miss it by a long way okay that's why it's called rocket science you kind of have to be precise okay when we're talking about vectors and things like that when you're trying to guide a spacecraft to a certain place that and the fact that the thing you're trying to land on is also moving that makes it a little bit more complex too. Okay. All right. Okay. So a more accurate description. Okay. Um, no, you know what? That's not the right word to use. Scribble that up. I shouldn't say more accurate. It's not more accurate. A more descriptive. A more descriptive description would be that Calgary's 40 kilometers away on a vector of 13 degrees east of north. Okay, that's where if you wanted to go to city center. Okay, um, why why am I taking out accurate there? Why is the word accurate not really true? Right. Right. It just didn't give me as much information. The measurement was equally accurate. It's 40 kilometers either way. Okay? I measured it to, to within plus or minus one kilometer. All right? I'm equally accurate, but this is more descriptive. It gives me a little bit more information. All right? So it's not more accurate, it's more descriptive. 
All right, so this description is a vector description, not only tells us where Calgary is, but also how to get there. Okay, so vectors are not always measured in, de in degrees with compass directions. For us, we're not going to be dealing with compass directions because then that brings trigonometry in. Not that you guys can't do trig, but we're not required to do it in Science 10. You will be required to do it right away in Physics 20. All right, so if you don't like trig, mm, physics might not be for you, okay, because we do a lot of trig in physics. All right. Um, what we'll do is what we call one-dimensional vectors. Forward, backward, right, left, okay, up and down. Right? One-dimensional. I know it seems like it's two, but it's one plane, right? Up and down is one plane. Okay, forward and backward is one plane. Everybody follow me there? Okay, so that's all we'll have to worry about. Your vectors will always be positive versus negative, or you know, one versus the opposite of it. All right, so distance versus displacement, okay? Distance is signified or represented by the variable small d, lowercase d, okay? Displacement is signified by lower place d, lowercase d, with the arrow over top to denote that it is a vector quantity. Okay, so let's say that we've got this situation. Let's say that it's four kilometers from my house to Walmart. If I walk to Walmart and I have like you know a pedometer on or I'm using my GPS or whatever, it'll tell me that I have to walk four kilometers. But if I had a helicopter, I could just go in a straight line from my house to Walmart. Okay, I can't walk in a straight line from my house to Walmart. Nobody can unless you live right behind. Okay, Walmart. You can't walk in a straight line to it because you have to go around things. Right? You can't walk through people's houses and stuff. All right. Um, so you have this. You have this four kilometers from your house, but in a straight line, it's only 2.8 kilometers at 30 degrees, 38 degrees north of west, let's say. All right. So that's the displacement. The displacement is a vector quantity, but here's the thing. The displacement is always the perfect straight line distance from start to finish, whereas distance is everything you had to do in order to get there all added up. Okay. So it ends up looking something like... I thought I had a picture. Don't have a picture. Okay, we'll draw one. No problem. Okay, so let's say that this is my house. All right, and over here is Wally World. Okay, now let's say that in between there is a river. Okay, and so when I get on the road, I have to follow the road, and of course, no roads in Okotoks go straight. Okay, and then it goes down. There's only you know the one bridge. Well, there's two bridges now. So cross the river here and then you know you got to follow and go up and over and then to Walmart okay something like that let's say well that's quite a bit further than if I just did that would you agree yes okay and that's why my distance is so much greater than my displacement right my displacement is the straight line distance and direction to get from A to B okay everybody with me so far all right, let's say I do that and it takes me a half an hour. All right, what's my speed if it takes me a half an hour to walk to Walmart? Remembering that the formula is that speed equals distance over time. Eight kilometers per hour, okay? Reason being, it's four over 0.5. When you divide something by one half, okay, it's like multiplying by two. So you get eight kilometers per hour because this was in kilometers and this was in hours. So you get eight kilometers per hour. Okay. What's my velocity? Not distance. Velocity is displacement over time. Okay. My displacement was. 2.8 kilometers at 30 degree, 38 degrees north of west. And it took me a half an hour. 5.6, right. Okay, so I'm going to go 2.8 kilometers okay, over 0.5 hours, okay, and I will get 5.6 kilometers per hour okay, uh, at 38 degrees uh, west, no, sorry, north of west. Everybody with me there? 
Okay, now I want you to keep something in mind before I try the next part with you here. Displacement is the straight line distance and direction from where you start to where you end. Now I walk exactly the same path all the way back. So I end up back at home. It takes me exactly the same amount of time. What's my distance traveled? Total. Eight kilometers, right. It's eight kilometers. I walked four kilometers there. I walked exactly the same way back. It was four kilometers back. My total distance traveled is eight kilometers. It took me exactly the same amount of time. So my total time is one hour. So my speed's unchanged, right? It's still eight kilometers per hour. Everyone follow me there? All right. What's my velocity overall? Okay, let's make it simpler. I started at my house. I ended at my house. What's my overall displacement? Zero. I ended up back where I started. Technically, I didn't go anywhere. I accomplished nothing because I ended up back where I started. My distance, my displacement from where I started to where I ended is zero because I ended up back at the same place. Everyone follow? If you go all the way around the world and end back where you started, your displacement is zero because your final position and your initial position are the same place. Okay? Your total distance traveled is very large. Okay? Don't get me wrong. You went a long way. But from a strictly vector perspective, you went nowhere because you ended up back where you started. All right? That's why the odometer in your car that tells you how many miles or how many kilometers are on your car measures distance. Okay. If it measured displacement, it would always read how far it was from the dealership to your house. Because you'd always come back to your house. Okay. It would be useless. Well, it would be great if you were trying to sell it because it would be like it was brand new. Okay. But it wouldn't be very good because it would be misleading to other people. Everyone follow me there? So displacement is how far you are from where you started in a straight line. Distance is how far did you go okay. in total, regardless of where you started. Okay. All right, so that means that speed and velocity have the same relationship. Like we said, we've already kind of talked about this. If you walked to Walmart and the trip took a half an hour, your speed was 8 kilometers per hour. Your velocity for the same trip was 5.6. But if you came all the way home, okay, your speed stays the same, but your velocity okay, equals 0 meters over 1 hour, and that's 0 kilometers per hour. Okay, your overall velocity is zero kilometers per hour. Okay, so key thing to remember here. Displacement is only concerned with where you are in relation to where you start. Okay, so um, more of a kind of simple Um, kind of version of this would be, let's say you've got um, on your street here, okay, let's say that you start here at position zero, right, and you go, let's say that that's, well, in this room it's east, so let's say it's east, okay, we're going to go east all the way to the end of the street, okay, and let's say that that is, oh, one kilometer, and then you realize that you uh, forgot to pick up your friend. So you drive back to here. Right. What's your distance traveled? 1.5 kilometers. That's how far I went. 1 plus 0.5. Remember, distance doesn't care which way you went. It just cares how far you went. You went 1.5 kilometers. What's your displacement? Terry? 0.5 kilometers. Which way? East. Okay, got to remember, it's a vector quantity. It's not only concerned with how far I go, but also what direction I go. All right, so my displacement in this case is 0.5 kilometers east. Okay, my distance traveled is 1.5 kilometers. No direction on it. All right, so that's kind of some of the stuff that you'll have to think about. Okay, when you're going here and there and whatever, okay, you might have to 
do stuff like that. Okay, that terribly difficult. Yeah. All right, um, I'm going to give you a worksheet that's got these on it here, but I want to go over just a couple first. Okay, um, so we've got this jogger that runs for an hour and a half at 2.2 meters per second. Right? I want to find out how far they go. Right? So my formula is V equals D over T. But just as we did with the mole equation, one of the first things we want to do is write down our what? Our givens, right? The things that the, the question gave us. Okay? It gave me time. Okay, 1.5 hours, and it gave me the average speed, 2.22 meters per second. And it's ask, sorry, that's speed, not D, V. And it's asking me to find D. All right, so my formula is V equals D over T. What are the units for time in my speed value that I was given? Seconds. What are the units for time in my time value? Hours. Is that apples and oranges? Yes. I can't divide apples by oranges. All right. So I have to convert apples into oranges. I don't know how you do that, but okay. I can convert hours into seconds pretty easily. How many seconds in an hour? You are the first class who did not right away yell out 60. Everyone always yells out 60. It's not 60, is it? There's 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. That is 3,600 seconds. Okay. So if I want to turn one and a half hours into seconds, knowing there's 3,600 seconds in one hour, what do I have to do with this? Multiply by 3,600. Right. Okay. So one and a half by 3,600 should give me. Oh, I don't know. I'm not going to guess. Going to embarrass myself on a. Well, it feels like a Monday morning. Yeah, it's 18 plus 36. What's that? That's 54, right? 5,400 seconds. Okay. We will embarrass ourselves and do it in our head. 5,400. All right. So our time is 5,400 seconds. Guys, something you always have to watch for. Okay? Your units have to match. If you were given velocity in kilometers per hour and distance in meters, you got to convert the distance to kilometers so that your units match. Everybody follow? Okay. All right, so V equals D over T. Now I have everything in the units I want. I want to solve for D. How do I get D by itself? Right, multiply everything by T. So we're going to move T over here. So just quick uh, algebra review here. Okay, I want D by itself. Multiply both sides by T. Okay, T times V, T times v equals D. Okay. What if I want to solve for T? Nope. If I multiply both sides by D, I will have D times V equals D squared over T. Well, I'm going to start out doing the same thing. I'm going to multiply both sides by T. But I want T by itself. But at least now it's on top. You can't solve for something if it's underneath the line. All right, that's a general rule. So what do I do with V to get rid of it? Divide. Okay, T equals D over V. How can you check if you've manipulated right? Okay, yeah, you could go back, but that won't always work because it, all it's going to do is give you the number you started with even if you did it wrong. If you just reverse something, even if it was wrong, it'll give you the number you started with. Okay, so here's what we got to do. You can always check with your units. Okay, plug your units in and see if you get the right units. What should this be in when I'm all done? Seconds, right? That's what we're dealing with. So distance is in meters. Okay, so that's like meters over one. And I'm dividing that by the units for speed, which are meters per meters per second. All right, so I'm dividing by meters per second. When you divide fractions, you actually reciprocate in. Oh, you guys don't know that one? You reciprocate and multiply? OK. What happens? 
I did sort of, yeah, okay. I reciprocated and multiplied, something like that. Okay, anyway, the meters cancel. What am I left with? Seconds. Is that the right units? Yeah. Okay, so you can always check by plugging in your units to see if you did it correctly. You won't need to generally most of the time because you'll just know. All right, but just in case if you ever need to. All right, so the only manipulations you're ever going to have to do are for D or T. Right? It's already set up for V. All right, so now, we, like we said, we want to solve for uh, we want to solve for distance. So we said we would have to multiply t times v. All right, so we'll plug in our numbers now, and that's going to be 5,400 seconds times 2.22 meters per second. Okay, seconds times meters per second. Okay, just look at the units here. Meters per second times seconds. Seconds cancel. I'm left with meters, okay, so I know I manipulated it right, and that should give me uh, 11,988 meters. So you ran just under 12 kilometers. Okay. Everybody good with that? All right. Um, do one more example here. This is what we call a uh, two-part that's maybe not the best way to describe it, but two-part question. All right. Um, so let's say you got a real-world situation here where you're traveling to Edmonton. Okay. So um, sorry, I got to do the conversion in my head here, guys. say it takes 30 minutes, 100, 100 seconds. Okay, so a question like this wants you to calculate your average speed. I want to give you guys a couple minutes and see if you guys can figure it out, okay, and then I'll go over how to do it. All right, so first thing you were probably thinking was this. Speed equals distance over time. All right, now, do you know the total distance? Yeah, okay. Um, do you know how long the whole trip took? No, but can you find it? You can, okay. Now, how many people were tr just going to go and go, well, I know the speed for the first part. And I know the distance and the time for the second part. I'll find the speed, and then I'll just average the two. How many people are thinking to do it that way? Okay, and that's the way most people think of to do this until I tell them you can't do that. Okay, here's why. If you average these two parts of the trip, you're saying they're equal. They represent equal parts of the trip, do they? No. Okay, you went way further at this speed than you did at the lower speed. All right? We can't just add them together and divide by two because that's how you've been taught to average your whole life. All right? It just it doesn't work here because we need a weighted average. All right? When I calculate the class average for you guys on a quiz or a test or whatever, yeah, I take the number of people in the class, I add all their and I uh, you know, take the the scores and I divide by the number of people. Well, that works great because everyone in the class is equal. Okay? But in a case like this, the two parts of this trip are not equal. So I have to weight it. Okay? Here's how I do that. I simply add something to this formula that wasn't there. Average speed is total distance over total time. Okay? If I know how far the whole trip is and how long the whole trip takes, and I plug those in, I get the speed. 
Agreed? Is that still D over T? It is. And that's how I always calculate average speed or average velocity over a trip that has more than one part. Okay? So, what I have to do is I have to break this up into the two parts and get all the information I need for each part. Because I am missing what from part one that I need? The time. I don't have the time from part one, but I can find it. All right. So in part two, I have the things I need. I know that the distance for part two is 50 kilometers. I know the time for part two is 18... Oh, that was supposed to be 18,000 seconds. No, no, 1,800 seconds. That's an hour. That's half an hour. Yeah, that's right. No, that's what I wanted, 1,800 seconds. Sorry, it just didn't seem big enough there for a second. Okay, 1,800 seconds. All right, and then in part one, I have the speed, okay, which was 26 meters per second, and I have the distance, okay, 250 kilometers. Can I solve for T with those two numbers? Yeah, okay, so T equals D over V. I just manipulate V equals D over T, okay, and I have 250 over 26. Yep. Nope. You travel 250 kilometers at 26 meters per second, then encounter construction. Yeah? Okay. Right, okay. Uh, yes, so we have to convert the kilometers to meters, so that's that's no problem. Okay, 250 kilometers is 250,000 meters, right, because there's a thousand meters in a kilometer. Okay, but good eye. All right, so 250,000, one more zero, okay, divided by 26 gives me 9,615 seconds, which is a lot longer than I'd anticipated it being, but it'll still work. All right, everybody with me so far? Okay. Now, I add my 1,800 seconds for the slow part. There's my total time. Okay, so now I have my total time. What's my total distance? 300 kilometers. So 300, okay, uh, divided by the answer I have there. Okay, and so I get that my... Sorry, 300,000. That was stupid. Sorry, guys. 300,000 meters okay, divided by um, 1415.38462. Oh, yeah, I only put one one up there. No problem. All right, there we go. All right, so. Um, no, that doesn't seem right either. How's my average velocity more than my fast part? Where did I mess up here? Did I mess up further up here? I must have. That's right. Hmm. Oh, because I'm an idiot. Well, you knew that before. Okay, here's what I screwed up. This is faster than that. See, this is what happens when you pull numbers out of your head, or somewhere else in this case. Hey, yeah, all right, that's a great example, Coder. We just screw that one up. Yeah, we're just gonna fix that. Okay, we're gonna make it 2,800 seconds. Actually, we're gonna make it even bigger than that because I want to make it like sorely obvious. Uh, 4,800 seconds. Okay, yeah, yeah, we went faster when we got to the construction, like all sensible Albertans would do. Okay. Um, all right, so let's just fix that. Start this over again. Sorry about that, guys. 4,800 seconds. All right, so that'll work better. 
All right, so this came out to uh, 916, right? Not, or 9,615. All right, so part one takes 9,615 seconds, and I go 250 kilometers, okay? Part two is only 50 kilometers, but it takes me almost half as long, again, to go that far. All right, so now when I do my total distance over total time, okay, so average speed equals 300 kilometers, the total distance, over the now much bigger total time of, okay, I'll just punch that in, um, 9615 plus 4800. I'm just going to round off. Okay. Okay, it's 14. All right. So 300 kilometers, okay, 300,000 meters is what that is. Okay. Divided by my answer. All right. That's better. Gives me 20.81. Is that velocity still closer to the 26 than it is to the slower part of the trip? Yes. Okay. It has to be because I traveled at that 26 kilometers for a lot, or 26 meters per second, sorry, for a lot longer than I did for the slower part. All right, so anytime a question asks you for average velocity or average speed, and the trip has more than one part, okay, you have to find out D and T for all the parts and then do a total at the end. All right, sorry about messing up the example, guys. It feels like Monday morning even though it isn't. Okay, so on that sheet, we've already done question number one. Okay, it was one of the examples we did. Everything on this sheet uses V equals D over T. And on this first side, everything is scalar. All right, so you won't have to worry about going forward and backward and having your displacement and distance be different. The first side is all just working on using V equals D over T. When you get to the back side, then you're dealing with vector quantities. Now you will have some forward, backward, okay, kind of stuff that you'll have to deal with. All right, but we can do some of those examples when we get to that. I don't know that we'll get to it today. You probably won't finish the first side today. The answers are on here. I know that. It wasn't a mistake. Okay, they're there so that you can tell if you did it right or not. Okay, don't just work backwards from the answer. I have a lot of people that get in that habit. They're like, oh, I didn't get it right. Well, I'll just work backwards from the answer. You know how much that teaches you? None. Okay. And then when you get to the exam, you go, oh, crap, there's no answer to work back from here. You're, you're an inclined plane wrapped around an axis. Okay. And so you don't want that. All right. Uh, make sure that you're not working back. If you don't get it, you don't, and you've tried it a couple of times and you're still not getting it, then just ask for help. Okay. And I'll come over and we'll figure out what's going wrong for you. Okay. Or we'll do it on the board if lots of people are having that issue. Everybody with me there? All right. So let's get to work on that. If you run into any trouble, we'll go through them together. At least your question. Yes. What's that? Okay, give me one sec then.